All right, hey, uh, morning everybody. Um, so, you know, nine o'clock into the week and everything, so we got people will be trickling in, but <coughs> um, as always, very far behind with stuff, and so I've had my coffee. We're gonna kind of plow through a few things. Um, hopefully, uh, also get to some some chance at, toward the end to to kind of connect some of the ideas that we've been discussing. Um, the the topic for today is um, general motivated behavior, and then particularly um, reproductive mating behavior. Um, that second topic is the stuff that you did all your recent blog posts about. Um, and then there'll be a couple of announcements. Uh, reports are actually, I guess, past due by now. Um, although a couple of people have had uh, have been sort of recovering from this col colds and flus and all other kinds of craziness. And uh, so a little. Uh, uh, so for if you've spoken to me, then that's that's fine. Um, uh, the, so here's where we've been and sort of where we're going, where we are today. Um, Sunday, 7 p.m. is the review <laughs> session. I think on some of the earlier PowerPoints I had said 9 p.m. Um, uh, it's, it's 7 o'clock is going to be our question and answer session for the final exam. Um, and then the final exam itself is Tuesday um, at 8.30. Um, uh, think about relationships between um, all four of the different units. Um, think about the neural circuits, um, the ones that I've drawn up on the board today the ones that I've drawn up on the board in the past uh, uh, and required the, today I've tried to I, we're going to draw up on the board today all of the um, uh, the ones that are sort of from this unit that I that I that I um, expect that you'll have available um, and then at the end of class I'm going to make sure that I get like close-up visions of each of them on the camera so you can refer back to those um, See that Haley's not here yet, but uh, I had oh, had an answer to her question, um, so uh, she can catch up with that at the beginning of the video about whether um, cerebellar uh, uh, the cerebellar system used uh, endocannabinoids. Um, and actually, this is um, I think useful to, to return to as an idea because um, this came up a few times throughout the semester um, in the context of first in the context of feed forward inhibition that a lot of the feed forward inhibitory cells um, express this. Um, gene parvalbumin, which is often used as a genetic tool for, for example, expressing chanorhodopsin or green fluorescent protein in them, and that would be whether you want to manipulate their activity with chanorhodopsin, or just find them, see where they project with green fluorescent protein, or maybe um, find them so you can record from them and uh, use it as a tool to help you collect data about those neurons and how they respond to various other inputs. Um, I mentioned last time that cannabinoid receptors uh, are sometimes involved in long-term depression as well as the short-term suppression of, um, of uh, inhibition that we've talked about. It turns out that in addition to that, cannabinoid receptors are sometimes found on presynaptic terminals of glutamate-releasing neurons. Um, and as a result of being found on presynaptic glutamate releasing neurons, sometimes you can get, um, uh, when cannabinoids are released, you can get suppression of excitation as well. Um, that particular point is not something that's going to be, uh, that you're going to come across on the final, um, but it just sort of illustrates again the idea that, um, that uh, biology sort of finds a solution and uses it over and over again in a variety of different contexts. Um, so, uh, in terms of what we're going to be doing today, um, oh, actually, one other thing I want to mention, I did, so, so long-term depression, even though cannabinoid receptors are present in the cerebellum, the long-term depression depends on metabotropic glutamate receptors, but not cannabinoids. Um, and so, again, those of you that have taken cellular neuroscience, um, uh, you can uh, sort of re refer back to that, or I'm happy to talk about some of the details of that as well. In terms of the plan for today, um, I want to uh, get most of the way through kind of um, this idea of visually guided eye movements. Um, we're going to return to the brainstem circuitry of that at the very end of class. The reason being um, that was the activity that you all did at the end of class last time. and. Um, and there was um, uh, uh, a few common answers that I got that were um, uh, uh, um, based on the information that you had would have been uh, totally correct. But I want to sort of um, point out 
kind of a more general approach to those sorts of problems um, because uh, it's, uh, it's quite likely that on the final exam I will either tell you about some new pattern of connectivity, um, either uh, uh, more detail to a circuit that we've already studied um, or, um, or a different circuit that we haven't studied um, and ask you to sort of work through what's going on with it. Or um, give you some sort of behavior or, um, or goal. So, you know, we want to create a circuit that's going to accomplish X and then ask you to come up with a particular circuit that's going to do that. Um, and so since people are sort of trickling in in the morning, I don't want to do that uh, at the very beginning. I want to save that toward the end. Um, but then after we finish with that, we're going to move on to talk about the emotion, emotion centers in the limbic system, a brief kind of recap of the basal ganglia in motivated behavior, um, a version of the diagram that we've seen a couple of times is already over there up on the left side of the board, um, and then uh, a parallel system um, that involves the limbic system and emotions um, that has very similar connectivity to the basal ganglia system. Um, that uh, that um, is involved in um, in motivate uh, in in, uh, in reward and connects in with a lot of the same structures um, and is actually it's sometimes the lines are a little fuzzy between the, the the sort of dorsal basal ganglia which is what this is and the ventral basal ganglia slash nucleus accumbens structures um, that we'll talk about at, at in, uh, bullet point number four. Um, and then the second to last thing um, is talking about um, reproductive behavior and pair bonding, the research articles that you already discussed um, in your blog groups, um, and then also a little bit of other research that relates that into humans, um, and in fact also connects human reproductive behavior with reward systems and basal ganglia. Um, and then the last thing we'll be returning to this um, uh, eye movements um, circuitry um, to, to sort of as an illustration of a new kind of circuit or sort of modification to a circuit that I showed you where I say, okay, now we're going to modify this circuit or take advantage of some of this connectivity to create a new, um, a new um, uh, output um, or create a new um, where we have uh, created a different input. So, so last time we had um, vestibular input driving eye movements, and then I asked you to think about well, how would conscious motor input drive drive eye movements. Um, and then, uh, and then um, for for the um, um, for the uh, so so we're sort of going to um, discuss a little bit about that uh, at the very end today. Any questions about kind of overall plan stuff? Anything like that? Okay, cool. Um, all right, so as a reminder, we talked about this a little bit um, uh, way back in Unit 2 when we were talking about the visual system. Uh, um, the eye, the retinal ganglion cells, um, actually make two different, the, the, the retinal ganglion axons branch and send information to two different structures. The structure that we focused the most on was the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus um, and its connection up with um, and its connection up with primary visual cortex. Um, and then from primary visual cortex, you have mostly cortical to cortical projections through the ventral stream, which is involved in object identification. Um, uh, interestingly, um, like we mentioned a couple of times, the, the most of the temporal lobe, with the exception of primary auditory cortex, but not even secondary auditory cortex, seems to get um, very little or no input from the thalamus, which is different from the rest of the, the entire rest of the cortex. Um, there are also cortical to cortical connections in, um, in particular to area MT, which we talked about before, which is a higher order visual system that is involved in um, identifying location and especially for MT motion of objects. Um, and then meanwhile, some connections are not drawn here. Um, there are V1 to pulvinar connections as well. That's what this PU stands for. Um, and then pulvinar connects up as well with MT. Um, and then MT is going to connect up with other parts of the parietal lobe, some of which are drawn here and we'll see again on the next slide and sort of continue on with. Um, uh, but but um, in the dorsal stream of information into the parietal lobe, um, we're 
identifying where objects are and beginning to think about interacting with them. Um, and like I mentioned a little bit uh, last class period, eye movements is something that um, for some technical reasons um, as, uh, as well as for sort of simplicity reasons um, are especially well studied especially in primates. So we have good understandings of some, uh, of some of the areas within the parietal and frontal lobes that are involved in eye movements. And so we're going to talk about that um, uh, right here. And then actually we're going to sort of put that on hold until the very end when we'll return to the brainstem circuitry for eye movements. Um, so... Uh, yeah, and so, so um, again, there's this, like the V1 to pulvinar connections aren't drawn in here. Pulvinar to V1 connections aren't drawn in here. There's some stuff that's missing, but the point being that there's this sort of se separate pathway from the retina to superior colliculus to pulvinar to MT, um, and that is um, one of the things that pulvinar is involved in is actually controlling eye movements and controlling sort of your perception of location because, um, as my wallpaper uh, uh, points out, um, pulvinar is highly connected up with the, the areas that are sort of the dorsal stream, the, 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 the parts of the brain that, um, that are involved in object location. Um, and then as this drawing indicates, and we'll see on the next slide, um, uh, the parietal lobe makes a lot of connections to the frontal lobe and into, air, into areas that are involved in movement. So this is a much more complicated drawing um, and shows interactions with things like the vestibular system, um, the um, uh, brainstem reticular formation, the pons, which we talked about is connecting up with the cerebellum, um, the substantia nigra, um, which is um, um, part of the uh, SNR, which is part of the output of the basal ganglia, um, and, uh, and the caudate, which is um, part of the dorsal striatum. Um, and so there's a lot going on in this slide. Um, in fact, you know, it, in, even though I don't expect you, uh, well, I sort of expect that you'll have all the slides with you, because why not, since it's open notes and everything on the final. Um, uh, it would be an interesting thing, uh, interesting idea to think about um, with, in the context of the basal ganglia movement system, how this frontal eye fields that we'll talk about in a second connection to striatum, which connects up then to the SNR through the direct pathway, might influence um, eye movements um, and influence learning of eye movements um, as an application of some of the um, of some of the um, ideas that we talked about back when we talked about the basal ganglia. Um, but for today, right now, what I kind of want to focus in on is um, more of what's drawn here, which is our visual system, V1 and V2, um, connecting up to area MT, which is this higher order visual area within the dorsal stream um, that was drawn on this last diagram to a human H HMT, human MT. This is now monkey MT, but anyway. Um, uh, so... Um, Higher order visual system in the dorsal stream that's involved in um, identifying location and movement of objects. Uh, and then area MT makes some strong projections to an association area that brings in, as well as what's drawn here, some information from somatosensation and even auditory systems about locations of stimuli and how you might want to especially move your eyes or your head toward some stimulus that's shown up in your world. Um, so if something touches me, I might move toward it. I might look toward it. Um, if, something, uh, if, if I hear something, I might look toward it. If there's a flash of light or somebody's hand shoots up in the periphery of my vision, I'm, I, I would look toward it. Um, and so all of that is being sort of uh, that, that, that sensory association of many sensations. Um, one of the places where that happens is in um, lateral, uh, uh, lateral, um, inferior, lateral interparietal cortex, or LIP. So this blue area here, which I've redrawn on the board there. Um, and then LIP um, makes connections back and forth with a part of the premotor cortex, which I've drawn a little bit out of scale here, um, uh, um, called the frontal eye fields, um, which are labeled as darker blue here. Um, and then um, the frontal eye fields make connections to motor cortex as well as some connections down into brainstem 
eye movement zones. And then we're going to sort of put that on hold because that was the assignment from the end of class last time. But I want to sort of wait until the end of class so, the, so as many people as possible can sort of see as we work through that circuit um, uh, and, that, and that assignment. Um, but for now, we'll just sort of say that, um, that just like the vestibular system can drive eye movements, um, so too can the frontal eye fields. Okay, so what questions do people have about this sort of sequence of connectivity? Um, we've also got, like I mentioned, some auditory input that comes up into LIP, some somatosensory input that goes over into LIP, um, and all of that can drive eye movements. So, yeah, so what questions do people have about all of that? Um, by the way, I, I have already, like, zoomed in a little bit on this so that uh, on the videos you can you can uh, if you miss a little bit you'll be able to see, catch it again but yeah yes yeah sure does the visual sense also go to LIP um, not not as much direct V1 to LIP it mostly goes through uh, MT and other areas in the uh, visual association parts the higher order or sorry, sorry the higher order visual areas before it goes to LIP similarly actually most of somatosensation goes through um, secondary somatosensory cortex before it goes to LIP auditory information goes through secondary auditory cortex and there's also some brainstem auditory information that comes up to LIP um, so yeah not directly from from the early visual system but sort of the higher visual areas like MT yeah yeah other questions about that Okay, so like I said, we'll return to what's going on with the brain stem here. Actually, um, one other thing that I did want to point out here. Let's back up. Well, in addition to, so we've got sort of here our eye that's projecting into an area called the superior colliculus. Um, the superior colliculus has its own redundant processing system. <coughs> um, and again, we'll return to this and include, and include the superior colliculus. This is not a connection out, that's just part of my border for occipital. Um, the superior colliculus has its own connections into the brain stem eye movement. So even with your cortex completely gone and completely destroyed, um, you can still make reflexive eye movements toward moving stimuli. And that's accomplished by the superior colliculus. Um, and in fact, these systems are entirely or almost entirely redundant with each other. Um, animals or humans who have had their superior colliculus damaged or destroyed can still make eye movements because of this cortical system through the frontal eye fields. Similarly, animals or humans who have had their frontal eye fields damaged can still make movements um, almost exactly as well as, as a normal person um, because of the superior colliculus system. So these are pretty redundant systems. Um, if you lose both of them, then your ability to make consciously controlled eye movements is, is, is uh, basically lost, although the vestibular control um, that we talked about last time would still be preserved in that case. Um, so these are actually, they're sort of two redundant systems. Um, the details of the connectivity within the superior colliculus we're not going to go into, um, but it's sort of interesting that, um, that at least for eye movements, um, there's, some, there's some redundancy. In fact, head movements also, um, and it's unclear. Uh, um, there, we haven't found like for other types of, well, yeah, there, there's some debate about um, for other kinds of movements. Um, in fact, there are some experiments people have done where they have completely destroyed primary motor cortex in animals and found that most of their ability to move around is actually surprisingly unimpaired. Um, so, uh, so in fact, probably for a lot of different kinds of movements, um, there are redundant systems um, in place for, for um, accomplishing movements. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Kind of both, yeah. So, so, um, so 
uh, as one of the things that's diagrammed here is that LIP projects back down to the superior colliculus. Let me see if I can find my purple chalk for that. So, um, and so in that sense, that would sort of be the conscious eye movement pathway that, that, that bypasses the frontal eye fields. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, other questions about that? Okay, so, um, so sort of moving on into the, the limbic system. Um, the limbic system is um, sort of the brain's loosely defined kind of all-purpose emotional system. Um, actually, one of the things that's drawn here as well is the four lobes of the cortex, um, the temporal lobe, um, which is involved in object identification, ventral stream visual processing, auditory processing, um, a little bit of somatosensation, olfactory processing, all in the temporal lobe, the occipital lobe, which is basically a dedicated visual area, um, the parietal lobe, which is combining vision and somatosensation, a little bit of auditory information, not so much olfactory stuff, um, the frontal lobes, which are involved in motor planning, life planning, deciding appropriate behaviors, um, inhibiting inappropriate behaviors. Um, your orbital frontal cortex is, uh, is one of the, sort of, it's sort of like the Jiminy Cricket conscience that's on your shoulder. Um, and in fact, if, you get, uh, if, if uh, you get drunk, your orbital frontal cortex is one of the first things, along with your cerebellum, that shuts down, which is why you become uncoordinated, because the cerebellum shutting down, and um, uh, disinhibited, because the orbital frontal cortex is shut down. Um, which is part of the prefrontal cortex. Um, and then in addition to that, within the frontal lobes is primary motor cortex, uh, which is involved in, in movement. Um, some people consider that the limbic system, which you find along the midline of the brain, um, including uh, some parts along the, middle, the midline areas of the temporal lobe, the midline areas of the parietal lobe, and the midline areas of the frontal lobe. Um, some people think that the limbic system, since it's um, its own sort of interconnected group of brain areas, um, including a lot of cortical areas and some subcortical areas, think that we should think of that as a fifth lobe of the cortex. Um, that is not visible out on the outer surface, but is just along the midline. Um, uh, it, that, that sort of argument can degenerate into a semantic argument. Um, but one thing that, um, that is very sort of relevant and important for what we're considering and thinking about um, today is that a lot of emotional processing um, happens in the limbic system. <coughs> so um, one area, this green area right here that's actually not labeled, um, but we'll talk about in, uh, in a couple of uh, minutes, is called the amygdala. It sits right in front of the hippocampus. Um, the hippocampus is um, a memory structure, um, possibly a spatial navigation structure as well. Um, and in fact, the amygdala gets, as we talked about early on, direct projections from the olfactory system. Um, and the hippocampus is getting pretty quick projections from the olfactory system. Remember the olfactory system being the only sense that does not go through the thalamus before getting to the cortex. Um, and that's one of the reasons why smells have this very sort of um, deep emotional context to them and often deep um, memory evocative um, context to them as well. Um, the blue parts of the limbic system um, are what are now sort of considered more the declarative memory parts, and then the green parts are sort of the emotional parts, but the lines between those get very blurry. Um, and there are some other areas within the thalamus, um, the, the medial dorsal thalamus, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes here, um, and then the cingulate cortex, which is this um, directly above the corpus callosum, which is this giant bundle of axons that connects the two hemispheres. Um, above that is, this, is, is, a, is a bump that sort of uh, cover, it's sort of directly above it, called the cingulate cortex, um, that becomes continuous with the um, orbital, orbital frontal cortex or medial, ventral medial prefrontal cortex, which is this sort of inhibitions and emotion area as well. Um, and uh, and the, the 
cingulate cortex has its own amazing things that it does. Um, it is involved in um, your conscious perceptions of emotion. Um, people with damage to the cingulate cortex, for example, sometimes experience something called asymbolia for pain. So we talked before about people who can't feel pain very briefly if they're missing a certain sodium channel. Um, there are people who experience pain, say it hurts, and say it doesn't bother them, which is bizarre to me. How can it hurt and not bother you? But, um, but one cause of that can be damage to the cingulate cortex. Um, other times, damage to the cingulate cortex can cause people to become randomly enraged. Um, and so it's, it's, it's this sort of high order conscious emotion, emotion processing center that as we'll talk about is connected up a lot with the amygdala as well. Um, as, as, there, there's, um, there's this figure here that I don't expect you to, to memorize or know, it is in the PowerPoint slides, um, that talks about many different areas that are connected up with the um, uh, or, or orbital um, frontal cortex. Um, it's not going to be on the final exam, but I just want to point out a few things. So the nucleus of the solitary tract, that was one of those areas that regulates blood pressure. So you get emotionally aroused and your blood pressure goes up. Um, the um, uh, the um, visceral sensory neurons, um, primary output nuclei of the parasympathetic and sympathetic uh, uh, motor system, the hypothalamus that we are going to talk about when we talk about um, uh, motivated behaviors in just a little bit, as well as the amygdala, which interconnect a lot, um, and then the uh, medial prefrontal cortex, the insular cortex. The cingulate cortex is actually not drawn on this, um, but, um, but it's sort of in, in a lot of ways similar to the insular cortex. Um, and so um, this, this, um, these emotional systems do tie into a lot of the things that we have already talked about in this class. Um, in the, for the, because we're kind of short on time, we're not going to go through all of these connections here and what they mean. Um, but just to sort of point out the, the, um, the, the fact that a lot of the stuff that we've talked about um, in this class so far does connect in with these emotional centers. So anyway, what questions do people have about that sort of overview of the limbic system? Um, one other thing that I'll just sort of point out, so prefrontal cortex, um, including, um, including um, orbitofrontal cortex, um, is, so... Um, it's the, pre, the, the frontal eye fields are much smaller than I've drawn them, and the orbital frontal cortex is going to be much bigger than I'm going to draw it here. But our orbital frontal cortex is right, it's named because it's right next to your eyes, and, um, and it's one of these uh, sort of big emotional processing um, and, uh, and uh, inhibiting inappropriate movements kind of areas in the brain. Yeah, um, and kind of continuous with the cingulate cortex. Okay, so questions about that? Okay, so, so drawn over here is uh, slightly elaborated, but basically the same thing that we've already seen before, um, which is the basal ganglia motor system um, and all of the different connections within it. So th what I called before the striatum which, um, depending on who you talk to, um, if, they, if they want to call the, another area the ventral striatum that we'll talk about in a minute, then um, there are some people who prefer to specify the dorsal striatum. But the area um, uh, that's sort of involved in this direct and indirect pathway projection, um, this diagram here, actually I forgot to include um, my dopamine releasing neurons, substantia nigra pars compacta, releases dopamine. Um, actually, and as a reminder, glutamate is excitatory, GABA is inhibitory. Dopamine, it depends. If the postsynaptic cell has a D1 receptor, dopamine is excitatory. If the postsynaptic cell has a D2 receptor, dopamine is inhibitory. Um, and we worked through before and it's by far the most complicated circuit because it's quadruple negatives um, involved. Um, but you should be able to and should practice working through um, the, this, um, this basal ganglia circuitry um, and, and sort of be ready to think about it and talk about it. Um, what we talked about last time is 
um, one particular subregion of the thalamus. So coming back here to, to my drawing of the thalamus, um, there's VLO and VLC, which are these blue areas. VLC is where the cerebellar inputs that we talked about last time are coming in. VLO is the place that we talked about a couple lectures ago where the basal ganglia inputs are coming in. These areas project up and connect to the motor and premotor cortex, which is why that motor and premotor cortex is color-coded blue. Um, and so VLO connects up makes excitatory connections into motor cortex. And as you work through this, when the direct D1 expressing, direct projecting D1 expressing cells in the dorsal striatum become active, which dopamine can do, then that will activate the VLO, activate the motor cortex, and promote movement. Um, when the D2 expressing cells in the dorsal striatum become active, um, then that will um, eventually inhibit the VLO and therefore decrease movement. But dopamine inhibits the D2 cells, so that means that dopamine turns off the brakes and therefore dopamine through the indirect pathway also promotes movements. That was sort of what we, were gonna, uh, what we talked about last time. Um, what I wanted to um, actually, I guess before I before I go into that, uh, let me let me back up. What, what questions do people have about a couple class periods ago, this circuit so far? Yeah, sure. So just to reiterate what you just said, yeah, I mean through either pathway, despite. The yeah. It, it will always... Yeah, because we have um, a plus and then two negatives, mm -hmm. so we end up promoting movement with dopamine, and then we have a minus and then three more negatives, so that all ends up being, uh, being promoting movement as well with dopamine. Yes, so dopamine ultimately always promotes movement. <coughs> um, there's more complexity, and depending on how I'm feeling, I might sort of ask you to... to uh, one of the things that, that you should expect on the final exam is, is uh, some new information to be presented to you where you'll have to sort of um, think about, okay, well, if we sort of have new ideas or some new, uh, you know, maybe... Um, uh, when I think one of the practice final exam questions said, maybe the GPI and SNR have different functions, and actually, that, that's not... That's kind of true and kind of not. The way that I describe their different functions on the practice final is not, in fact, the way their different functions work. Um, but it is sort of saying, okay, we've got this idea about these different functions. How does that? How might that influence the way we think about this circuit? And so you should expect things like that. Um, so here, let me actually draw this sort of in here. So we have inhibition into the VLO. That was what we talked about before. New information for today um, is um, sort of over there on the right. The dorsal striatum is huge. And um, uh, which again, the dorsal striatum is the same thing I call the striatum. There's a section toward the end of the final exam review notes that's like annoying terminology. And the, and the fact that the dorsal striatum is the same, is sometimes just called the striatum, is among the list of annoying terminologies. Um, <clears throat> anyway, and actually, only some of the connections are even shown here. Just the direct pathway connections are even shown there. Um, but in any case, uh, and actually, GPI plus SNR is sometimes called the dorsal pallidum. I never use that term, but the book does. So, you know, you gotta, if you're reading the book, then you're going to have to uh, uh, work with that. Um, okay, so in addition to the, the, the motor connections that we talked about before, there are connections up from the, the striatal pathways into multiple other nuclei within the thalamus. Um, <clears throat> this ventral anterior or VA nucleus um, is going to project into the prefrontal cortex, um, which is 
illustrated by its present here, although they made the prefrontal cortex green because, um, uh, because also the uh, MD projects into the prefrontal cortex as well. Um, so VA and MD actually sort of both project into the uh, prefrontal cortex. Um, in addition to that, there's this little nucleus inside the striatum uh, called the uh, internal nucleus, or IN, that's also getting projections from, um, from a variety of inputs, including the internal globus pallidus, the GPI. And then this internal nucleus here projects out into widespread areas in the parietal, occipital, and temporal cortex. And the meanings and uses of all of this is very poorly understood. Um, but um, one of the things that, um, that as we talk about motivation and this parallel pathway involving the ventral striatum, also known as the nucleus accumbens, the ventral pallidum, and its connections into thalamus, is that there's not really a clean distinction between the motor system that we talked about last time and the emotional motivational systems that we talked about, that we're going to be talking about today. Um, and that is... And so, you know, makes for a lot of complexity, um, but in some ways also makes sense in that, um, uh, in that movement and motivation are very closely tied together. Um, and in fact, some people even argue whether there is a clear boundary between the dorsal and ventral striatum at all um, in these two parallel pathways that we're going to be talking about. Um, there's not f much projections into the cingulate directly through this system here. Um, MD gets there a little bit, but not very much. Okay, so, so the point of this um, is that these areas, prefrontal cortex and other cortical association areas, are also communicating both sending input to the basal ganglia, the dorsal basal ganglia, and getting output from the basal ganglia. The meaning of all of which is, um, is very much an active area of research, but the point being that motivation, sensory perception, um, and uh, and um, are all sort of tied together with this mo these movement structures uh, or these sort of structures that we that we traditionally think of as movement areas. That's sort of the bottom line of all of that. So um, there's sort of yeah, I think more unknowns than knowns in that. But in terms of uh, what questions do people have about that? Okay, so um, all right. So let's see. Let's find where I was. Okay. <clears throat> so here, let's actually. Um, so here, I've again kind of based. This is basically just redrawing a lot of what's up there on the board. Um, I've added in the two different pathways, the indirect and the direct pathway of the, of the dorsal striatum. Um, it's the same thing that's over there. But the ventral striatum connects up to an area called the ventral pallidum, which also has some, some thalamic projections. Um, and um, just like the substantia nigra pars compacta provides dopamine input to the dorsal striatum, the, the, there's another area right next to the ventral tegmental area, or sorry, right next to the substantia nigra called the ventral tegmental area that provides dopamine input to the ventral striatum. Um, and that's sort of already on this diagram that I was showing a second ago. Um, one sort of uh, a very early observation about the ventral tegmental area is that when good things happen to an animal, 
the ventral tegmental area becomes active and releases dopamine. And so a lot of times when you think about dopamine or when you hear about dopamine, one of the first things you hear about is reward and pleasure. And this is the sort of reward pleasure pathway for dopamine. There's this whole separate movement promotion pathway that's over here. And actually one of the reasons why cocaine causes, or methamphetamine causes both a high and hyperactivity is because the high comes from these projections into the ventral striatum which is also known as the nucleus accumbens. And the um, substantia nigra provides dopamine to the dorsal striatum, which promotes movement. Um, and since cocaine doesn't distinguish between those and increases dopamine at both, you get both a high for the ventral striatum, nucleus accumbens thing, and also movement promotion for the dorsal striatum pathway, hyperactivity. Um, and in fact, many, many drugs of abuse, um, uh, in one way or another, enhance either directly or indirectly the amount of dopamine coming from the ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens, which is the same thing as the ventral striatum. <clears throat> um, uh, some, some of them are inhibitory and they, in, they inhibit the, they, they decrease inhibition in the ventral striatum, or sorry, in the ventral tegmental area, um, which then causes more dopamine release. Um, one thing that I don't love about this diagram is it looks like the axon sort of goes only halfway. Um, in fact, the axon from the VTA goes all the way into the ventral striatum um, and is miles long on this, on this sort of cellular scale here. Um, but in, in any case, um, um, the ventral striatum uh, is sort of our, our reward pleasure pathway. Okay, so questions about that before we sort of get into a little bit more a little bit more complexity about the ventral striatum. Yeah, sure. Does the GABA block dopamine? The GABA, yeah, what the GABA neuron there does is it's going to inhibit the, this neuron that's releasing dopamine, and then opiates will inhibit the GABA neuron, so then you have less inhibition and therefore more dopamine release. Yeah. Other questions? Um, okay, so this is one of those class periods where since I'm so behind, I just drew a bunch of stuff on the board already, and then you hate, um, but like I said, we'll, 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 I'll make sure the video captures it, uh, 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 captures all of it. Um, so a little bit simpler, but very, very analogous to what we have over there for the dorsal striatum, <coughs> mostly motor and motivationally guided motor pathway up there. Um, this is our ventral striatum, um, aka nucleus accumbens pathway. Um, and so again, many cortical areas provide input into the ventral striatum, provide excitatory input into the ventral striatum. Um, it gets dopamine signals from the ventral tegmental area makes inhibitory projections into the ventral pallidum, which is sort of like the GPI in this um, in, uh, uh, session here. Um, and then that makes inhibitory projections onto a variety of thalamic nuclei. Um, you'll notice that a lot of the same thalamic nuclei that were up there are also getting there's some, there's, there's some finer structure within the thalamic nuclei of some cells getting input from the ventral um, system and some cells getting input from the dorsal movement system. But on sort of a coarse level, areas VA, MD, and IN are getting inputs um, from both um, pathways. And so again, areas VA and MD project out to the prefrontal cortex, again, including orbital frontal cortex. Area IN makes these widespread projections. Even though the area is pretty small, it makes some widespread projections throughout a lot of the uh, cortex. Um, and then, uh, and so uh, actually the one that's highlighted here is um, what's coming from um, mostly area uh, VA into the orbital frontal cortex is what's highlighted um, uh, in, this, um, uh, in this diagram here. Um, 
uh, area VA and MD into the orbital frontal cortex um, is what's highlighted in this diagram on the right. But in fact, there's a lot of widespread cortical projections from this. Um, actually, to com com complicate things further, and I'm not going to draw this up here, um, but the VTA also projects directly and makes dopamine projections into the frontal cortex as well. Um, but that's something that if you took neurobiology of disease with me before, that, that might ring a bell. Um, for this class, we're going to just ignore that because there's enough to keep track of already. Um, yeah, so sort of one more quick thing. Um, very little input into primary motor cortex from this pathway, but then we have this area LD which projects into the cingulate cortex. Um, and, um, and that's um, and that's illustrated as well in this picture, area LD projecting into the cingulate cortex. <coughs> um, and so, uh, and actually, I'm just going to, since we're going to talk a little bit more about the cingulate, um, I'm just going to redraw it over here for simplicity. Area LD is projecting into the cingulate cortex. Um, and this is, again, the cingulate cortex is sort of our, our main conscious place where we perceive emotions. Um, and, uh, and, so, um, and so that's sort of the emotional context associated with all of this. Um, actually, one of the, uh, well, let me, before I move on to the next tangent, what questions do people have about this that's over here? I know I'm sort of throwing a lot of circuitry at you right now. Um, all of these different thalamic nuclei, um, I'm not going to expect you to have them super well organized on the final exam. Um, and, you know, it's worth sort of having track of things and everything. Um, but um, the, the big picture, again, that we're trying to get at here is that um, especially for this system, actually this projection through area LD is really sort of the, the one that makes it unique from that projection that goes through VLO. So that one goes through VLO and has its motor component. This one goes through area LD and so has this more emotional component to the cingulate cortex. Um, and then both of them have overlapping inputs onto area, re the rest of the cortex. Um, so, um, but I guess if you're going to sort of focus in on one thing for this system, um, it would be these projections to area LD and the um, and the sort of emotional context associated with that. Yeah. So anyway, questions about that? Yeah. Sure. Um, are both systems equally as likely to fire? Or? I mean, it depends what's going on. Um, so uh, so when you're um, when you're thinking about um, sort of movements and thinking and also um, like uh, uh, you know. How, uh, how to sort of um, uh, do better at something and sort of have, have a sort of, um, uh, this, uh, sort of active planning and things like that is going to involve more of this dorsal system. Um, when you're sort of in a more reflective, like, uh, you know, thinking about what's gone on in the past and, um, and, uh, and sort of um, uh, internal processing kind of stage is more likely to involve this. Um, like I said, the boundaries between them physically and functionally are very, um, are very uh, uh, ill-defined. And some people wonder whether there really is even a, a clear boundary between them. Yeah. Other questions about that? Um, so the book describes a little bit about um, uh, so the the um, the two pathways here, um, and um, the point of this is just to sort of illustrate the the rewarding aspects associated with the ventral striatum, the pleasure aspects associated with the ventral striatum that's not really there in the dorsal striatum. So the experiment is that we have an animal and. There is um, inserted into its brain is a little tube that can squirt dopamine out or squirt saline out. Uh, actually, squirt out cocaine, which enhances dopamine signaling, or squirt out saline. Um, and um, uh, and so 
Um, and then that two, that, that two, there's one tube for dopamine, one tube for saline, um, that is either inserted into the dorsal striatum or the ventral striatum. So um, uh, in the left two bar panels, we've inserted the drug into the um, dorsal, into the ventral striatum. In the right two, um, we've inserted it into the dorsal striatum. And we're looking at um, how much time they're spending in these two chambers. And so when we deliver cocaine in, ch in the left chamber, then um, to the ventral striatum, then the animal starts to like being in this chamber and spends a higher fraction of its time over in the area where it's getting cocaine and less of the time over in the area where we're just squirting salt solution into its ventral striatum. Um, for the dorsal striatum, there's less of an effect going on, um, not a significant effect. Um, so the animals getting cocaine into their dorsal striatum, what's not plotted here, will become hyperactive, um, but not necessarily develop a preference for one area versus the other. They might move more in this left chamber, but they're not going to develop a preference for it. <clears throat> yeah, questions about that? Okay, so a couple other areas that I just want to refer to, um, I'm going to sort of draw them disembodied over here, are the amygdala and the hypothalamus. Um, and there are interconnections between the amygdala and the hypothalamus, and in addition, so so sort of just like before, this is, a, this is a sort of branching inhibition where the inhibition can go to any of these areas. Um, the amygdala connects up to area LD and then gets to the cingulate cortex, which connects back up with the amygdala. So we've got, if we just sort of focus in on the amygdala and the cingulate in area LD of the thalamus, um, this is... Um, a sort of interconnected group of three brain areas that are involved in um, uh, sort of early emotional processing in the amygdala and conscious emotional processing in the cingulate and, um, and, uh, and sort of collectively creates this, um, this sense of uh, um, uh, um, either uh, enjoyment or displeasure depending on what's going on and which specific cells are active in this. <clears throat> um, there's a lot more, there's some subregions within the amygdala and many, many subregions within the hypothalamus. Um, the amygdala regulates, um, you know, th uh, other things, regulates things like blood pressure, regulates, um, um, uh, uh, um, like, uh, uh, through, through the hypothalamus can regulate sleep-wake cycles um, and a lot of other things that we're not drawing in here. But just to sort of um, illustrate where the amygdala and hypothalamus fit into this picture, um, and again, hypothalamus is sort of involved in a few things. Um, one is your autonomic nervous system, like Dr. Barth talked about. Um, another that we'll talk about in a second is reproductive behaviors. Yeah, so questions about that? So I want to kind of move into, spend the last little bit talking about reproductive behaviors. <coughs> um, and so the, the blog articles that you just did um, focus in on um, uh, um, pair bonding, uh, mating behaviors. Um, there's also a whole sort of subregion of reproductive behaviors that just involves arousal and, uh, and the act of mating itself. Um, which we're not going to talk about today, just to be, uh, mainly for lack of time. Um, but one, there, um, a lot of the research also ties into um, some stuff involving human um, um, reproduction um, and human um, and human love, um, and uh, and so there are a variety of things that people do. Um, one of which is to recruit volunteers who um, who. Uh, 
probably a bunch of college students and find somebody who's like, you know, when the ad goes up and says, did you just fall in love? Come for an fMRI study. Um, and, so, um, and so what they do then is they show these people either a photograph of the person that, they're, that they say that they're just sort of falling in love with or a photograph of a friend and see which brain areas uh, activate differentially. Um, and one brain area, uh, it's a couple brain areas that, active, that become active when, they see the photo, when the people see the photograph of the person that they've just fallen in love with are the ventral tegmental area and ventral striatum, or nucleus accumbens, um, showing that this sort of is a, a reward-centered pathway um, and activates a lot of the same reward systems that, the, um, that uh, other, uh, other things like, um, like shopping or whatever, um, uh, gambling can activate. Um, another study that was done is, did you just get dumped? Come for an fMRI scanner. Um, uh, oops, I skipped ahead. That's this one. Did you just get dumped? Come for an fMRI scanner. And what they find there, we're not going to sort of worry about the specific areas that are in, uh, activated here, um, but um, looking at the brain regions that are active, it exactly matches. So again, showing them a picture of the person who just dumped them versus a picture who, uh, of, of a friend. Um, exactly the same brain areas that you see present and active in cigarette smokers when they're craving a smoke or drug addicts when they're craving a hit of whatever drug that they're addicted to. Um, and, so, um, and so withdrawal symptoms and uh, so, so again the sort of pleasure drug related systems are all sort of present in the, um, uh, in the um, uh, uh, in, involved in, in, in human, human love and human interaction. Um, one other thing that happens actually is the amygdala and some parts of the prefrontal cortex actually become underactive um, back in this experiment where you see the person that you, that you fall in love with, the amygdala and prefrontal cortex become underactive um, and so the amygdala is sort of one of these areas that's sort of involved in like fear um, and, and sort of uh, uh, caution in certain situations. Prefrontal cortex, like I said, sort of the, the Jiminy Cricket, the, the inhibitions. Um, and this may explain, for example, why people who are in love um, uh, end up not noticing something that others might consider very obvious as a red flag about the relationship, for example. Because there's sort of um, a higher uh, sort of awareness of what should I be worried about um, what sort of things should, should, uh, should I be um, uh, uh, concerned with and, and, and inhibit my behavior and so on um, actually becomes underactive in this, in this experiment here. Any questions about those three experiments? Okay. Um, so... The research articles that you talked about, I'm going to go relatively quickly through this because you just spent a while with the blogs on them. Um, summaries of them, the manipulations and so on are, pre are posted on the, um, on the topics guide. Um, and I do want to get to, back to this, um, this thing from the end of class last time about eye movement circuitry. Um, so... <clears throat> uh, one of these was looking at monogamous versus polygamous species of vole. Um, so we have prairie voles, which tend to be monogamous, and meadow voles or, mo or mountain voles that tend to be polygamous. And just at a behavioral level, what we find is that um, when you have um, a male and female that have, that have mated together, um, the prairie voles tend to spend a lot of time to, uh, snuggling together. The meadow voles kind of don't care so much about spending time with their, with their partner um, or with their mate. Uh, and looking in at their brains, we find that there is a much higher density of vasopressin receptors um, in the um, in the montane vole, or sorry, in the prairie vole, as compared to the montane vole. And so, in fact, the hypothalamus releases vasopressin, and um, and that's involved in reproductive bonding. Um, one other thing that the hypothalamus also uh, also um, releases is something called um, oxytocin, which um, also 
at least in the voles, more so in females than the males, seems to be involved in reproductive behavior. So this is the male brains. Um, the female brains, the oxytocin seems to be more involved. Um, uh, that, whether that's really true for, for humans is, I think, probably unlikely because humans are much more complex and, uh, and don't have these sort of distinct evolutionary, they're not different species the way these are. Um, and so um, the, the, I, I do think, and there is evidence that vasopressin and oxytocin are connected to pair bonding, but a lot of the evidence indicates that um, it's actually sort of both, um, both neurohormones um, are, are involved in, um, in pair bonding in both males and females, in humans. And, and that's actually still also something that's a little bit up for debate. <coughs> um, so one other thing that they did in this study is to um, uh, put more vasopressin receptors into the metavoles, those polygamous metavoles that don't care about their partners after they've mated, give them some extra vasopressin receptors in the males, and now the male spends a lot more time huddling together um, with his female partner than he did than, than, the, than, the, than the comparison group that don't have this extra vasopressin receptor. So not only does it correlate with the behaviors, but we can actually manipulate vasopressin receptors um, in this polygamous species and get more um, mon monogamous-like behavior out of them. Any questions about that? Yeah, sure. And the vasopressin and the receptors are put into the hypothalamus? Into the hypothalamus, yeah. Yeah, so actually the hypothalamus both releases and receives oh. the vasopressin. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, so this uh, second paper that was one of the um, blog papers is asking about, um, uh, or maybe I can't remember. This might, there, there was one. There, there's one here today that we're going to talk about that wasn't one of the blog papers, but um, but it, one of the other ones asks about. So where in the brain is vasopressin acting? One place is the hypothalamus, and that's what we saw in the last article, uh, in the last yeah, in the last research article. Um, now what we're doing is we're looking at the monogamous voles, but we're trying to block vasopressin signaling, um, and they look at area MD of the thalamus. VP is the ventral palladium. So I don't have extra colors, but I'll just draw our vasopressin as vasopressin's coming into area MD of the thalamus. Vasopressin's coming into the ventral pallidum. Um, vasopressin is sort of, uh, uh, um, uh, if you put it um, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, sort of in the whole animal, medial amygdala. Um, so um, and in, uh, in many of those places, um, when you infuse, um, I, I actually, sorry, I, so, so many of those places there are connections, um, but the one thing that they found that was sort of the critical connection, um, so, is, uh, so if, you, if, you put, um, if you put a vasopressin blocker into the medial amygdala, even though it gets vasopressin inputs, doesn't seem to change the pre preference for partner over stranger. Same thing in medial dorsothalamus. But interestingly, in the ventral pallidum, if you block vasopressin signaling in the ventral pallidum, now at a, a low dose of an antagonist, it doesn't do much, but a high dose of an antagonist, and now all of a sudden, these males don't care about their partner anymore. Um, and so this pair bonding pathway ties into hypothalamus and sort of um, low-level autonomic reproductive behavior, but also ties into um, uh, these higher-level um, uh, connections involving um, uh, emotional regulation um, and depends on these emotional regulation areas. Okay, questions about that? <coughs> Okay, <clears throat> um, I think this this was the one that that um, no, th no th yeah this is um, again uh, this is one that you all did so um, so here we're looking at oxytocin and dopamine um, and one of the things that they found so this uh, this quinprinone compound is um, an antagonist for D two type dopamine receptors. Um, Turns out, where'd my purple go? 
I don't know. Um, in the ventral striatum, we have actually a little bit more of a mess where there are some cells that express both D2 and D1 dopamine receptors, and the excitation inhibition that, I, that, that comes out in the dorsal striatum is a little bit more messy. Um, but blocking D2-type dopamine receptors um, in females now, um, uh, 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 or sorry, I sorry, I said that wrong. Um, um, yeah, yeah, you know, blocking, yeah, blocking D two type dopamine receptors um, is uh, is going to um, enhance partner preference um, uh, in um, in these in these polygamous uh, voles. So the controls don't care about the partners um, uh, and don't ke don't care whether it's a partner or a stranger. Um, if you have um, a D two antagonist, then the, then they start to care. Um, Similarly, if you block oxy, uh, if you put oxytocin in, now they start to care about their partner. Um, so just, uh, um, uh, but, um, uh, oops, so yeah, so, um, uh, and then if you block oxytocin with oxytocin antagonists, now they don't care about their partner again. Um, and then there was this other. Uh, article as well that, that we talked about that sort of similar things but looking at um, at huddling together between uh, female to female prairie voles um, and the female to female prairie voles um, uh, oxytocin has some influence although not as dramatic as with the female to male um, interactions um, in the in terms of um, promoting sort of this same sex social behavior. Yeah, questions about those. Um, they're again summarized as well in the in the um, uh, in the topics guide. Um, one other thing that um, that oxytocin is involved in is um, is uh, parental bonding. Um, in animals, m many mammals um, uh, being polygamous and not having um, parental care, so there are some exceptions like the prairie voles. Um, uh, it's been more studied in females and female um, uh, parental bonding, but in humans and in other animals where there are, is paternal care for, for children, um, oxytocin is also involved in, in, in paternal love. Um, and one other interesting study um, uh, is um, uh, so unlike backing way up here are newly in love people where these pleasure centers get involved in, um, in people who are newly in love um, this was looking at uh, women um, who, um, who are involved in long term um, monogamous relationships as opposed to being newly in love um, and um, comparing their brain activity when they see their long term partner versus when they see their child. Um, and the sort of take home message from this, um, again, we've got some similar areas um, in terms of the, the, the um, parietal cortex, lateral prefrontal cortex, um, uh, amygdala is active again. Um, but the, the sort of take home message from this is that the pattern of activity, um, if, I, if I covered up which was the maternal uh, uh, and which was the romantic, it would be very hard to distinguish between them. Um, and so for long term committed behaviors, um, the, the, the love, the brain activity associated with that starts to resemble more and more um, the um, uh, um, uh, parental um, uh, love. Yeah. Questions about that? Okay, a um, few quick sort of housekeeping things before we move on and talk about the, the last topic involved in um, the activity from the end of class yesterday. Review Sunday night at 7, uh, Ween 4623. Course evaluations, please fill those out if you haven't already. Um, I'll continue to send annoying emails out to people who haven't, um, uh, including uh, uh, calling you out for sleeping in class when you weren't really sleeping in class or whatever. Um, but, uh, but you should please fill those out um, because they are uh, um, very, very valuable to help me improve the classes that I teach. Um, and also, um, there, uh, there's actually going to be a different instructor for this class next year, but what's working and what's not um, is going to be very valuable information for that person as well. <coughs> um, actually, so... I, T Tessa, before I, before I um, uh, move this board out of the way, can you kind of zoom in on that just to get a good picture of that with the camera? Um, yeah, okay, so um, 
<coughs> the assignment from last time was to look at this circuit here and think about ways that we could tap into it, much like we tapped into the pain withdrawal reflex in the spinal cord circuit to um, uh, control conscious control of walking. Here now we want to sort of tap into this circuit and control the conscious perception of that, uh, uh, it's conscious control of movement. So I've, get, I've kind of simplified down a little bit this circuit where we have the right of Ducin's nucleus, which directly activates the lateral rectus, excites the ocular motor, uh, left ocular motor to activate the left um, uh, medial rectus and get both eyes moving to the right. Um, and then the left abducens does exactly the opposite, um, taps into the right ocular motor um, and, um, and left lateral rectus. Um, this projection here, this would be an acetylcholine projection, 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 this is going to be a glutamate projection, this is going to be a glutamate projection, but they're all excitatory projections. And so collectively, um, we're either going to move, left abducens gets both eyes moving left, right abducens gets both eyes moving right. Um, uh, a lot of people put um, that we would just have the motor cortex uh, activate Scarpa's ganglion. Um, that would be, um, uh, uh, um, based on the information you had, that would be a full credit answer, but in fact that's not what happens um, because uh, Scarpa's ganglion, if that got activated, um, or if the medial vestibular nucleus got activated, then every time I wanted to move my eyes, I, I would also start to feel dizzy because I'm activating the sensory inputs that are involved in sensing excuse me, um, sensing uh, vi uh, vestibular uh, um, inputs. Um, there were other ideas about the motor cortex directly activating the medial and lateral rectus as well as a few others. Um, I sent a lot of people emails about their particular things. Um, the um, motor cortex doesn't directly ever connect to muscles. Um, it's always going to have to go through some motor neuron in the brain stem or spinal cord. Um, that little thing up there. Um, and so that's not uh, that one doesn't quite work. Um, but one of the things so that, that, that we're going to want to do, kind of analogous to, um, uh, to, this, um, uh, to, to what we talked about in the spinal cord, is we want to have some sort of command neuron or pattern generator neuron. So somewhere else in the brain stem, we're going to have this area. This is going to get maybe direct or indirect projections from M1, and maybe also direct or indirect projections from the motor parts of superior colliculus. Um, because again, these are redundant. So here we have our frontal eye fields projecting into M1, like I drew over there um, uh, before, a couple minutes ago. Um, this is going to connect into this brain stem command neuron. Um, and then um, we want to excite, if, if we're going to want to be doing um, uh, leftward eye movements, then we're going to want to excite the left abducens and then maybe activate some inhibitory neuron here that's going to inhibit the, the right abducens. Um, this is not the only solution, but I think it's one of the simplest solutions that you can um, create. Um, and in, in the exam, you may be asked to create a circuit that's going to accomplish things. Um, and so as long as you're sort of careful and it fits with the data um, and the, and the uh, parameters of the problem, um, you can still get full credit. Um, but to me, uh, this is, actually this is in fact what happens. Um, and this is a sort of nice, uh, uh, simple solution or sort of minimally complex solution to the problem um, where we're sort of taking advantage of command pattern neurons just like we had in the spinal cord. And then these neurons will excite this structure that's going to um, activate right medial and left lateral rectus and then indirectly inhibit this structure so therefore turn down the right lateral and left medial rectus muscle activity and therefore move the other way. And then we would have on the other side a command neuron that does the exact mirror image where it's going to turn up the right abducens and indirectly turn down the left abducens and get your eyes to move the other direction. Yeah, sure. Um, so my report was on central pattern generators. Yeah. And so, um, and like the 
know of any like uh, ascending inputs from the motor? So from from the motor from the spinal cord back up. It would be like from the motor <coughs> being targeted. So in this case, like the eye muscles back yeah. up to the like free motor areas, like where the central pattern generator is. Do you know of anything? Like um. Uh, no, not that I'm aware of, but that, that's probably just my ignorance. I imagine that similar patterns to what we see in the spinal cord we would also see here in this case. Yeah. Um, yeah, what other questions do people have about this? Sorry, Tessa, is it zoomed in on this enough that it's... it's, it's okay, can you zoom back? Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Awesome. I'm sorry. Thanks. Other questions people have about that? Okay, cool. Um, all right, so uh, I think that's, that's most of everything. I've got five minutes left to sort of talk about um, a couple of the things um, in just a second. Um, remember, your reports already should be done unless you've talked to me um, about, um, uh, about um, uh, you know, um, too many extra exams this week um, or, uh, or if you've been sick or whatever. Um, then, uh, and and um, uh, if, you, if you have neither turned in your report nor talked to me, then we definitely do need to, to exchange emails or talk after class. The review session is 7 o'clock on the 7th. Um, the final exam is on the 9th. Um, and please do fill out your faculty course evaluations. Um, and so I just wanted to, to um, for the last five minutes or so, thank you all. Um, uh, so um, uh, some of you, this is sort of the first class you've had with me. Um, for a lot of you, this is um, second or third class you've had with me. Um, and I really appreciate the time and effort that you all have put into this class um, and that you all have done um, in terms of um, uh, sort of making this an interesting uh, uh, um, uh, course for me to teach. Um, the questions that you ask that sometimes push me in a new direction to think about something that I haven't thought about before um, uh, and um, and uh, the you know feedback on the blog assignments and your willingness to sort of do that as well has been very very helpful um, I also um, as I think I've told some of you, um, uh, I'm kind of next year going to be doing a little bit more of administrative uh, stuff and a little bit less teaching. I'm not going to be teaching some of the upper division neuroscience classes next year, so that means that even though I'm still going to be around and I hope to still get to see all of you as much as possible, um, it is likely that for most of you this is the last class that you're going to have with me, um, which is a little bit sad for me, um, and I, but I do still hope to, um, to uh, um, uh, whether this is your first class or third class or whatever with me, um, uh, you know, keep in touch and hear about what you do um, over, the coming, uh, over the coming times. Um, and so uh, since I get now four minutes to just sit on a soapbox and talk, I'm going to do that because uh, why not? Um, and, um, since, and since also a lot of you are graduating or sort of thinking about what you're going to be doing with your careers, um, uh, I think everyone in this room um, at this point in their life has or will have times when you sort of question what you're doing and question whether you're on the right path. And in fact, a lot of times when you come talk to me, um, I will say, well, why med school? Why not go to grad school? Um, and, um, and I'm not really doing that to be annoying. Um, I'm doing that because, uh, because um, I want to sort of help make sure that, that, that you, uh, you find the right paths for yourselves. Um, and one of the other things is that if you sort of think back, you've probably all already had times, whether it's in your personal life or your professional life or whatever, where there have been, where there's been tension between where you are and where you may want to go. And in your life, you sort of build up motivation, or sorry, build up momentum as well as motivation to get to a particular goal and then may come to a time where you think, Maybe that's not really where I want to go to. Um, uh, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm in the wrong relationship. Maybe I'm on the career, wrong career path. Um, uh, maybe the inertia and, and, uh, and, um, and momentum that I've built up is something that I need to change. Um, and so uh, it's... Um, uh, uh, I, um, one perspective that I kind of want to share is a quote from, uh, from uh, YouTube. We watch a ton of YouTube videos. Uh, it's guy Hank Green, um, uh, it, where, in which he says, um, uh, you have no obligation to your former self. They are dumber than you, and they don't exist. Um, uh, so as you're sort of, when you come to these points, um, you don't owe your old self anything. Um, and you have... Um, every right to sort of readjust the, your path in life. Um, I wish 
that I could just say, and you probably hear this a lot, I w uh, you probably hear this advice a lot, I wish my advice was just to, well, just abandon and go on. But if you do that all the time, you're never going to get anywhere in your life. Um, and so um, there's a somewhat longer quote here um, uh, the, uh, from his brother, John Green. Um, uh, it says, much is lost in the name of never sacrificing or accommodating, always following your heart. Um, but again, much is also lost in, all, in, in always accommodating um, uh, and always sort of sticking with things. If you're looking for simple answers on how to live a good life, look at elsewhere. There are losses and gains in any choice. Um, and the binary between extraordinary life and ordinary life is treacherous and profoundly false. Um, and so I wish I could tell you, you know, always stick with your goals. Stay true to what you've decided because that's going to get you to where you want to be. Um, but that's also not really always the right choice. Sometimes the right choice is to abandon where you are, find something new. Sometimes the right choice is to stick where you're going. Sometimes it's to find a compromise. There's not one, any one easy solution to these situations. Um, and so sort of one last uh, quote is that um, the most important thing about life is that it occurs out of equilibrium. Um, to stay alive, we need to continually process information, interact with the environment. Um, our lives are finite. And the, finite, the finitude of our lives lead, uh, creates poignancy in situations. At every moment, we decide who we are and how we behave, and that's a choice that we individually make. There are real challenges and real opportunities in life, um, and I hope that as you move forward in your lives, you face those challenges and opportunities with awareness of where you are and the momentum you've put into your life, as well as awareness of what you want now, and take both things into consideration as you decide what the next step is going to be for yourself. So anyway, that's my soapbox time, and thank you all very much. Thanks.